Welcome. welcome to Faces and Places today. I'm noticing my, I've got a little bit of feedback, so I'm just going to actually quickly put my headphones on. Sorry. Okay, hopefully you all can hear me a little bit better here. Um, I have just a couple quick announcements, and I want to jump right into interviewing our guest today, Tanya Golasik from um, Jimmy Choo. As you all know, our fashion critiques were due last week. They are all now graded and in the system, so please go in and check things out sooner rather than later so you know if there's any issues or concerns. Um, lecture prep questions are due before class. I actually saw I got a lot this week, which is great. I know everyone's chomping at the bit to, to talk with Tanya. Um, so please uh, make sure that you email me back your email question after class on that same email chain. And as always, there will be an attendance question at the end of the lecture. So uh, for full credit, please send that to me on my email address. Lastly, um, the one-to-one -one career advice link is posted here. And I will put this um, poll deck live on our content under Blackboard. Um, if you have not yet signed up for a time and would like one, please do. I think the first available is beginning in November, but there are lots of spots left. Um, just a reminder of social media. Uh, as, as you know, things get posted there a little bit earlier than emailed out to you, so it's a way to keep informed and no uh, extra credit opportunities as well. And our remote guidelines, particularly if there's anyone who's joining us today for the first time, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand and I will call on people and say that you do. Um, if there's any immediate or pressing or technology issues you want to call out to me or Tanya or the group, please type them in the chat function and I'll be following along there and I'll make sure to respond to you. And if you're speaking, please turn on your camera. And that goes for if you raise your hand, preemptively turn on your camera so that by the time we get to loaded and ready to go. And please only unmute yourself when you are ready to speak. This class is being recorded. A flash of our schedule, just um, the next three weeks coming up, we have Lauren Dudley Stevens next week, CEO and co-founder of Dudley Stevens. The week after, we have another group of co-founders, Maddie Grayson and September Voda from Tucker Duck. And following that, Sarah Tosetti, who's a costume designer um, on Broadway um, and also in Paris. With that, I would love to introduce you guys, introduce you guys to Tanya Olesic. Um Since taking over Jimmy Choo business in 2016, rather, uh, the, as president of the Americas, now part of Capri Holdings, Tanya is leading the brand into expansion as a full luxury lifestyle omnichannel brand. Before joining Jimmy Choo, Canadian-born Galassic moved to Canada to serve as global CCO of Canada Goose, where she was charged with developing the brand into a top-performing global luxury player. Ms. Galassic also spearheaded the pre-IPO strategy for the company by increasing brand awareness and revenue in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Japan. Prior to Canada Goose, Galassic was global, the global SVP of sales and planning at Marc Jacobs, part of LVMH, where she was credited with the launch of the business planning division at Mark by Mark Jacobs. This division helped to increase productivity and profitability for the brand, at which time Mark by Mark Jacobs was one of the leading contemporary accessory brands. Ms. Glassic also served as vice president and SVP role with both the Jones Group and Ralph Lauren in New York. Ms. Glassic serves on the Fashion Footwear Association of New York Board and the Zag Zagreb School of Economics and Management. For that, please join me in welcoming Tanya to our class. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you? You good? good Even if not in person. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see anyone in person at this point. I know. <laughs> yeah, such a luxury. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yes, we're so happy to. And um, you have an amazing path and a lot of amazing, amazing brands on your um, on your resume. Would love to hear a little bit in your own words, your um, career path and how you've gotten to where you are. Sure. Um, so as you mentioned, I was actually born and raised in Canada. Um, and by default, I guess, my mother um, was a retailer. So my mother owned two boutiques. Um, and at that time, when I was a teenager, I would work, you know, on the weekends or during the summer. And I really, um, at that time, always had a love of fashion. Um, I don't know that retail was necessarily my thing, but I enjoyed working at my mother's store. 
And what I really enjoyed was going on buying trips with her. So at that time, you know, in Canada, the where you go on buying trips um, is Toronto. So I would go to Toronto and Montreal with her every season um, with different designers and, and work collections with her. And I just noticed at that time when I was doing that with her, it was something that came really kind of natural to me and it was something I really, really enjoyed. Um, so that's how I got into fashion. And then when I was on one of these buying trips, um, there was a designer in Canada uh, who's a little bit controversial actually right now, but also um, at that time he was the largest probably wholesale uh, Canadian designer and sold to Saks and Nordstrom. Uh, his name was Peter Nygaard. Um, and that's where I went with my mother on one of the buying trips. And and the person who at that time was the vice president of sales uh, was in the showroom working with my mother and I and noticed that I had kind of a, you know, a natural inclination of being able to, you know, put things together and, and just kind of chat about the business. So at that moment, while I was in university, um, she asked me if I would be interested in working for them. And of course, um, I was studying political science, thinking I was going to be a lawyer and uh, no better time than the president. And I was like, yes, I would love to start working. Um, so anyway, so I did work at Nygaard for a long time. I worked there for 10 years. Um, and pretty early in my career, I knew that Canada wasn't necessarily the place to be for fashion. Um, and I really wanted to come to New York. So at that time, I begged my boss to uh, transfer me to New York. And that took two years, about two years. Um, and I've been in New York for 20 years now. So um, and then, like you said, I've worked for a lot of different fashion brands. I went to Ralph Lauren at that time. Uh, and then I went to Jones, Marc Jacobs, Canada Goose and, and Jimmy Choo now for four and a half years, which is awesome. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell us about your role there at Jimmy Choo, you know, kind of vision that's happening right now in these crazy times. So I am the president of the Americas. So I oversee anything to do with Jimmy Choo for North America and then also South America. So Mexico, Brazil. Um, so, you know, I, during these weird times, I guess is, is kind of a different story to what I do now. What I do now is, is become more creative and try and figure out how to sell product uh, to people who don't necessarily need to buy uh, designer shoes. But, you know, I think the one thing that we can all kind of learn from this, and if you look at history, is that there's always opportunity in, in different situations, like a pandemic, for example. So um, the one thing that has been good about this time is that I've really been able to spend a lot of time with my team coming up with new ideas, coming up with the, you know, what if COVID lasts for another, God forbid, two years? What can we do differently? So there's been a big shift, as I'm sure you know, into online. And so our e-com business, knock on wood, has been pretty phenomenal um, as a okay. result of that. Stores are okay, but I think people are still, depending on where they live, I think they're still nervous to go into stores and to have that social interaction. So we're really trying to be um, pivot and be more agile in terms of how can we bring Chew to you? How can you bring the store and the experience to the client? So we actually, at the beginning of the summer, purchased um, a van, like a Mercedes Sprinter van, and, and branded it Jimmy Choo, and, and we bring Choo to you. So you can uh, literally have the store brought to your house so that you don't have to leave your house, and we can bring it to you with one of our um, top sales uh, representatives and, you know, everything in terms of COVID and, and rules, everyone wears a mask. And, you know, it's just trying to figure out how do you still engage people and, and keep them um excited and, and wanting to buy product during this time so it, it's there's the, the days of come on into my store and buy some shoes or bags is over so i think it's up to yeah. everyone now in the fashion industry to figure out what works for their client and especially a luxury client who actually probably has you know a more demanding type of um role you know so so that's something yeah. we've been working on a lot definitely is that in every market that you have a store that you're doing that or only certain markets so we started in the Hamptons uh, this summer. And so it's the Hamptons in New York is really what we did for the summer. And we're um, so we wanted to test it and see if it was successful. It was successful. Um, and then we may buy more vans and put one on the West Coast. We may put one in wow. Florida. Um, but, you know, people people are still willing to shop, but they want to have that experience. They don't mm -hmm. want the experience in the store. So sometimes, you know, it's a it's a woman who wants to buy some shoes and she has 
three girlfriends and they come, you know, to her house and we bring the shoes there and they can try on their sizes and, you know, we serve hors d'oeuvres or whatever to at least make it kind of a fun experience for them. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's something that we've been really working on a lot with our top clients, but anyone can do it. It's not just a top client. Anyone can do it. That's very cool. I, um, I feel like there is a running list of things that are positives that are coming out of COVID. And I, I feel like that's going to be the top of a lot of people's list yeah, exactly. and that may actually end up pairing over because it's just it's such an amazing work. I mean, a lot of, a lot of those extra customer service things are going to be hard to stop because people are going to really enjoy them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you bring things to people, it seems to work well. You know, I think people appreciate the fact that they don't have to be in an environment that they're nervous in or that they, you know, don't necessarily want to leave their home or they're at home because their kids are being homeschooled, you know, so it's just that little bright light of bringing shoes to people. <laughs> yes. Which is a, which is a great bright light at these times. <laughs> yeah. uh, pre COVID. Um, could you tell us, a little bit about you know sort of like a week in the life of uh sure. yeah <laughs> yeah um a week in the life of me uh would be so i go to milan four to five times a year because that's where the collection is presented to us um so that's when we go to milan for a week and we see the entire collection for basically you know the the six months ahead um and the buyers the planners um you know we look at all of our selling we look at what the trends are uh, we see the presentation, the marketing, all of those fun things. So, so that's a lot of fun going to Milan and having that preview into what's to come. Um, but then after we get home, that preview, you know, you have to build strategies from that. And then after that, execute the strategies in retail, online, um, and then also with our wholesale partners, so department stores as well. So there's a lot of um, analytical data that, that feeds into that. There's a lot of trends that feed into that. Um, and then there's a lot of different geographies that feed into that because people who shop in Beverly Hills are not necessarily the same as the people who shop in Miami, who shop in Atlanta, for example. Um, so I do travel a lot. And then I also travel within the U.S. Um, quite often because we do have stores in almost every major city uh, in the U.S. and Canada as well as South America. Um, and then day to day, I'm in the office and, and, you know, we have a showroom in New York, which is amazing. Um, and so meeting with clients, whether it's the, um, marketing piece of my job and meeting with, you know, Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and L or whether it's the finance piece of my job and meeting with, you know, my CFO and team, or whether it's, you know, meeting with the wholesale account. So there's a lot of meetings, there's a lot of planning. Um, and then there's a lot of strategy and execution and store visits and really keeping the teams motivated and excited about what's to come. That's great. Thank you. Um, is Jimmy Choo doing anything currently to be more sustainable or, you know, were there projects happening, I guess, before COVID as well? Because I know that's, I had to put a couple of things on the back burner. There were projects that were started and announced actually in, I believe it was February at the UN. Um, so Jimmy Choo is now part of Capri Holdings. Capri Holdings is Jimmy Choo, Michael Kors and Versace. So we have a commitment um, that over the next three years um, to sustainability and how that's going to evolve over the next three years. And this was a, something that was signed at the UN back in February um, that we are committing to do that. We are looking right now, in addition to that, at um, you know different types of materials. Obviously, we we banned fur, we have banned a couple of other things over the past couple of years. But how do we look at you know different vegan products for shoes and bags, um, and just how do we also reduce our carbon footprint too? Right. So all of those things. There's a huge committee that works on this all day long, um, and that is a goal that is happening now. Um, are we as far ahead in the world as a Patagonia, for example? No, we are not. But the good news is, is that we have signed something and made a commitment to um, make sure that we move in that direction. And so there's been a lot of steps that have, are being taken. And so, you know, all three of those brands are, are very large brands too. So yeah. doing that at the same time is, is no easy feat, but it's uh, something that we've committed to as a company that's being worked on as we speak. Yeah, that's great. Is there, yeah. a, is, other than large strategic initiatives, like is there actually any operational day-to-day -day functionality that is the same between companies within Capri? I mean, there are, so Versace just came on board, I 
think it's been a year and a half ago. So what usually ends up happening when you're forming a group is that it starts with logistics, it starts with IT, it kind of starts with all the back end things because as companies are born and then they're built and they're and we're all at different stages in terms of where we are um, and we're all different um, nationalities too. Jimmy Chu is originally from London, Versace obviously is from um, Italy, and then Michael Kors is American. So it's interesting because it's like you've got the UN and you're trying to get everyone on the same page <laughs> with different types of personalities and different yeah. types of business practices, right? Because it's all cultural. So there's that piece first and foremost, but then there's the back end that, that I that I just mentioned. And, and even looking at, you know, CRM and stores and how we service our clients and what are those tools that we use um, so that we're all on the same systems. And if anyone has worked in a large company and has had to either go through an ERP or a system upgrade, it takes time yes. <laughs> and it takes a lot of patience, but it, it is slowly but surely happening. And, you know, all of these things happen because there's a cost benefit as well in terms of, um, you know, having everyone on the same system, having everyone with the same, you know, uh, CRM system, uh, logistics, warehouses, and you're able to benefit from that around the world globally because they're the three global com companies that are coming together as one. And right now we are all finally, Versace was supposed to move into our building. We work uh, in Bryant Park. And so uh, we have a Michael Kors office. I think we have about nine or 10 floors between Michael Kors and Jimmy Choo. And now Versace has uh, joined. They were supposed to move um, in March, but thanks to the world that we live in today, China. they just moved in the last two weeks. So we're now in the same headquarters, which is super exciting. Um, but there's so much work going on right now from, like I said, logistics, IT, legal, like sharing services or having a shared service um, type of business. But the one thing that is amazing about Capri and our, our CEO is that um, he's left the business units and brands to themselves. And what I mean by that is that you'd never want Jimmy Choo to be Versace or Versace to be Michael Kors or Michael Kors to be Jimmy Choo. So all of the brands have remained with their creatives intact, their businesses intact, so that we can continu continue to operate as that brand versus, you know, kind of amalgamating brands together. So you'll you'll never see that, but there are, you know, some of the, I hate to say boring things like the logistics and, and things like that, which just help uh, improve that's everyone. Yeah, yeah that's great. It, it, it makes the efficiencies so much better. So that's what is being worked on too, as we speak. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so what, um, the, goals of, the goal of this class, I think I've told you, is to give everyone a little bit of an idea about different roles in the industry. And you kind of came up in sales. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to them a little bit about what that role is like and, you know, what, what it means to be an account, yeah, to be an account executive in sales or? Yeah. Um, I, I love being, I, I love being in sales. I miss being in sales. <laughs> like I, I kind of still am in a way um, because you always default to that if you're a salesperson. Yeah, I think, sure. uh, working in sales is really where you get to learn everything. Um, it's like a full 360 view. And what I mean by that is that you're in front of clients, you know, if you're working with wholesale accounts like Saks or Bergdorf, for example, um, you work with design, you work with logistics because, you know, in addition to selling the product, the product has to get delivered. It has to get delivered on time. People have to pay their bills. You know, there's a marketing component. You have to make sure that the um, wholesale accounts are following your marketing guidelines. So I think, I feel like sales is the point person for almost everything in fashion. Um, and so you have to have a lot of patience and you have to be able to pivot a lot. And you also have to be um, a pretty open personality. And what I mean by that is that when you go from dealing with people in finance to people in logistics, to people in design, everyone's a different personality. Creative people are very different than financial people. So I think the key to success in sales is really understanding how to navigate those personalities. Um, and it, it's amazing how much that can help you in your career in sales. And then of course, selling, right? Selling the product, um, convincing, uh, whether it's wholesale accounts or retailers, why your brand is great. You have to do a ton of analysis to explain to them why they need to buy something that they bought the year before or something new based on their sell through. So 
you know, in addition to loving the product, you also have to have the analytical financial piece of understanding what worked and what didn't work. So, um, because you'll be challenged all day long, as you know, on, you know, <laughs> things that, you know, you sold a collection the last season, but the, the collection was a total bomb and they've decided that they want to take a break from the collection. Well, you have financial people who have budgets who are telling you what your budget is. So you need to figure out how you're going to make that work. Um, but it has to be smart. It's not just a, a gut feeling that, okay, well, we think this collection is better. There has to be facts. You have to be able to look at the numbers, look at everything and, and put together the story and the story that's appropriate appropriate for that retailer in order to make that sale. So I feel like sales is just, when you're in sales, you learn everything. <laughs> you learn how to unpack samples. You learn how to steam samples. You learn how to do just about everything there is. Get people coffee in the showroom. I mean, there's just so much and I'm so grateful that I started there and I had that opportunity because I do feel like, and, and it, it's not, um, it's not a bad thing, but I have so many young people who say to me, oh, you know, I want to be in marketing and PR. And then I say to them, okay, well, what do you want to do when, after that? And they say, oh, I want to be the president or the CEO. And, and I always say to them, you know, you need more than just marketing and PR if you want to be the uh, president or the CEO of a, of a fashion company or a brand, because you need to understand all aspects, which includes the, the part that I just mentioned, the, the financial piece too. So I feel like sales is just such a great place to start to learn all of those things. And then when you're in sales and you're dealing with marketing and PR and you're seeing really what the process is, then you can then decide, hey, I actually prefer marketing and PR. But I feel like sales kind of sales is like a buffet. You get to you get to choose everything. <laughs> Sample. And then, yeah. And then figure out what you like the best. Yeah, that's a really great way of thinking about it. I mean, yeah. Very smart. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, you've worked at some fantastic brands, some especially, you know, especially Jimmy Choo. Um, and I think one of the things that admirable you know particularly about Ralph Lauren and Jimmy Choo and Mark Jacobs is just how well they maintain their brand integrity out there um how hard is that to do and you know what kind of strategies do you have to keep in mind when you're working yeah I I think it's really difficult I think um I think if you work for a luxury brand whether you work at Ralph Lauren or Mark Jacobs or Jimmy Choo I think the discipline that comes with understanding, you really need to first and foremost, immerse yourself in the brand. So you need to sit back for the first couple of months and understand the brand DNA, right? You need to understand that this is who Marc Jacobs is, this is what he stands for, um, you know, and, and this is the brand. You have to look the part, and what I mean by that, one of my pet peeves, and you know, people who worked at Ralph Lauren experience this too, is, you don't walk into Marc Jacobs and wear Ralph Lauren. You don't walk into Ralph Lauren and wear Balenciaga. You don't walk into um, Jimmy Choo and wear Christian Louboutin. I mean, so that's like 101. You need to, yeah. as I say, drink the Kool-Aid, which means you're so excited that you got a job at a brand that you really want to work for, then really, really, really be part of that brand. Look the part wear the shoes, wear the brand, and be proud. Because people know as soon as they see you, the first thing they do, if you say, I work at, at Jimmy Choo, they look at my feet. Or if you work <laughs> at Ralph Lauren, they look at to see what you're wearing. Like That's what comes with the job. So I think that's um, super important. And then while you're in that role, then take the time to be with the people who've been at that company for a long time. Listen to all of the briefs that come from the designers in terms of what their inspiration or what they believe in. And really immerse yourself in that culture because that's the key to success in terms of brand discipline. Because everything after that, then you know what kind of the Bible is in terms of, or the playbook, I should say, of what's acceptable at Marc Jacobs, what's acceptable at Ralph Lauren, that you know, when you're placing yourself in a marketing catalog at Saks and you work at Ralph Lauren, you're probably not going to be sitting next to Rick Owens, you know, like you have to understand what that brand stands for and then who the friends of the brand are that are acceptable to be part of that. Um, and then it goes along with the brand integrity, whether people um, are, you know, you have to protect the brand, make sure things are on sale at the right time or not on sale um, because that also happens. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of discipline that comes into, you're basically protecting the brand at all times and that's your job. Yeah. yeah. I mean, speaking of sales, I know you were at Canada Goose and I feel like they're 
very well known for not doing markdowns. So I mean, that must yeah. be a very hard line yeah. in the stand to draw. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> particularly, particularly in outerwear where you could just have a cold, exactly. a, a warm winter and <laughs> no snow and no coat soles. Exactly. Um, where has been your favorite place to work over the years? Huh. Um, I think Jimmy Choo is definitely one of, I have two favorites. It's Jimmy Choo and Mark Jacobs, hands down. I was at Mark Jacobs when Mark was the creative director of Louis Vuitton at the same time. Um, and I was the SVP over Mark by Mark Jacobs, which was a massive brand at that time. And everyone in the world had a Mark by Mark bag. Um, and I think Mark just comes from this kind of creative genius world that very few people do. And, you know, he's a pioneer and he's um, he just stands for so much. And it, he is just amazing working there. I had an amazing team. Um, and as part of LVMH, so of course LVMH is, you know, one of the premier houses in terms of all of the brands that they have. So I think that was just such an amazing experience and being able to go to Paris and, you know, um, review the budgets and, and do all of those things and go to the shows. So Mark Jacobs was definitely an amazing, amazing experience. And um, Jimmy Shu, I mean, I've been here for four and a half years now, and um, we have a female creative director, Sandra Choi, which is amazing because there's very few brands that have, you know, had female creatives as their, um, as, as the brand leader. Uh, so that's amazing. And Sandra is hugely talented. And Jimmy Choo has such a um, amazing DNA and history from, you know, Sex in the City to um, Princess Diana to just being so well known in, you know, um, uh, all of the award shows, Red Carpet. Um, we just did a collaboration with Timberland, which was a massive success. And so, so many, you know, great people like Alicia Keys and Megan Thee Stallion and, you know, all these people who um, who love Jimmy Choo, right, and, and where wore the Timberland collaboration. But, you know, there's just a lot of great history with Jimmy Choo. And, um, and it's really a company that supports women and shoes give everyone confidence. And I think that's such a, a great story to tell. Um, yeah. So I would say those two are my my two favorites so far. Yeah. Uh, is there a least favorite that you feel comfortable talking about or a lesson learned, I guess? <laughs> um, there is. Um, I would say for me, um, Canada Goose was a tough one for me. And it was a tough one for me because 20 years ago, when I was in my 20s, I decided that I wanted to live in New York and move to New York and be part of this big fashion world. And to go back to Canada, you know, 15 or 16 years later, was it was tough i mean even though i'm canadian it was a it's a i think when you live in new york city for such a long time and you work in new york city and you work in fashion in new york city which is a whole other level of kind of like crazy and exciting and you know <laughs> non-stop i think when you go somewhere else like canada for me it, it was a difficult transition from a from a cultural standpoint um, so that was, I would say that was a little bit challenging, um, living in Toronto again. And I love Toronto. Like I love going back to Canada, but I don't want to live in Canada and I don't want to work in Canada, um, just because the pace is much slower and Hey, maybe when I'm older and, and that's kind of where I want to, you know, live then then I understand that. But I think for me, New York and fashion in New York or even, you know, Europe is just, a, it's a different level. And I found um, I found like I was going backwards by going back and that, and that's not disrespectful at all to Canada or anything because I, it was a global role. So I, I traveled all the time, but I felt culturally for me, it was not a great fit. And, um, yeah, I mean, but I, I learned a ton, so that's the good news and yeah. all that. And you always learn a ton. <laughs> yeah. Good or bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, it's actually one of the themes that I've been talking about a lot with students throughout the semester because we're all sitting at home, um, you know, some of us in India, some of us in Korea, some of us in New York City. Um, just the different cities that you can work in, the different opportunities that are out there and these different personalities of cities. Totally. Yeah. Um, so I find it very interesting that you knew you were able to find a role in your hometown to go back check out, but you had kind of uh, drunk the Kool-Aid of New York and not, yeah. we're not so into it by the time you went and did it. I did drink the Kool-Aid in New York, yes. <laughs> but I, it's a very important factor, I think, in making that, that city decision for yourself, you know, what type of city 
yeah, be looking it, for. Absolutely, I think it's hugely important, and I think that anyone who can learn that at an early stage, because I think when we're young, we're just so desperate, like, okay, no, no, I want to for this brand, this brand, this brand, and you're like, I don't care what city it's in, I'll, I'll go, but. Um, I think you really need to, and I always say this, and this is the advice I give to everyone all the time, is listen to your gut. And I didn't listen to my gut about Canada Goose. Like I knew I didn't want to move back to Toronto and I, I yeah. voiced that, but I still did. And I was like, oh, I'll figure it out when I get there. And it's kind of like, yeah, that probably wasn't <laughs> fairly, you know, and, and that's probably the only time so far, knock on wood in my career anyway, that I haven't listened to my gut. Um, but I learned that that'll never happen again. So that's a good yeah, thing. That is a good lesson, <laughs> for sure. It's important to take that time to understand what, what exactly you want, you know? Yeah. 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 I have a good friend that followed you to Toronto and she stayed. It was, it was a good move for her, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just all depends on where you are. Exactly. Um, so what does your team look like at Jimmy Choo? Um, I, I, you do res retail and also wholesale, so I don't know how, what of your business is bigger and so at jimmy two when i started 50 i would say that wholesale and retail were about 50 50 and we've really pulled back on wholesale i think and everyone knows this i'm not saying anything that's controversial i don't think i think that um the u.s department store business even though it's massive compared to the rest of the world it's very challenged and i think you know at that time when we took a look at what we needed to do we were in too many stores, for example, at Nordstrom, we were in too many stores at Saks. So we really pulled back on this, these little stores and little places where we were doing no business. Um, so today we have a much healthier balance of full sell. So it's definitely retail slash Omni, which is our e-com, um, which is, has been very successful, thank goodness. Um, and wholesale, we've shrunk to the size it should be because just because we're Jimmy Choo and we're luxury brand, it doesn't mean that we have to be in every single city in America because it's just not appropriate for some cities. So um, yeah, we went back and we were strategic about the doors that we decided to exit so that we weren't over distributed in, in a lot of cities. Um, so right now retail wholesale, or, or excuse me, retail in e -com, which is Omni, is really our focus because that's where you can do the best storytelling from a brand perspective. Um, because no one's ever going to protect your brand the way the brand does itself. So um, you're able to do the buy the way you want so that the client can always see the best of the best and have the best experience in your own stores. Um, and, you know, we try and do the same with wholesale. We try to recommend, um, you know, what the, the fashion group is for the season or the color story is for the season. But at the end of the day, because you have so many other brands sitting next to you on a floor, a lot of the time buyers will buy you for a function. So if they think that the Jimmy Choo pointy toe pump is the best pointy toe pump, they'll buy the Jimmy Choo pointy toe pumps, but they won't buy them from Chanel. From Chanel, they'll buy booties. And and uh, and that's really tough because you do have designers who design full collections and you have someone who comes in and kind of picks and chooses parts of your collection. So, um, yeah. you know, we're really focused on continuing to develop retail and in the e-com um and that's really where we're seeing wins and successes that's great yeah um ella sure I, I i think you have a question you there ella hello hi hi i'm just turning on my video hi how are you Hi, good. Hi. How are you? You're you're amazing. Thank you so much for for all your advice. And um, so my question is, is what does it require to keep up like a lo the luxury of a brand, and how is this possible while it gets bigger? Can it lose its it can it lose its authenticity and or luxury? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I think people can lose their authenticity when they start trying too hard. And what I mean by that is that if you're Jimmy Choo or if you're Marc Jacobs and then all of a sudden you decide that you want to be Uggs or you want to be, you know, listen, I mean, look at during COVID right now, Jimmy Choo, we're known for high heels and for, you know, sexy, confident styles, but there's not a lot of women who are sitting at home wearing high heels right now, right? But that doesn't mean that we pivot and start making, you know, furry boots like Uggs. It means that we start, you know, we do flats, we do sneakers, we concentrate mm -hmm. on other things, but you don't walk away from what your DNA is, right? So right. as long as you always stick to your DNA and you know that you're Jimmy Choo, 
then that is your authenticity. And, and I think you guys have probably heard this quote a million times, but a really good marketing test is that if you look at a magazine and you put your hand over the brand and you're still able to know that it's Ralph Lauren or that it's Marc Jacobs, then you're doing your job, right? Because mm -hmm. as soon as you start training yourself and, and you continue to tell the same story, the same story, the same story, so that people understand what the brand stands for, um, then that's really when you're successful. And I think you could do that with most Ralph Lauren ads. I think you do it with most Jimmy Choo ads. I think you could do it with most Marc Jacob ads or anything, Dior. Um, so I think that's hugely important in terms of authenticity because Young people like you know what a story's not real, and, and young people are way smarter than we were, that's for sure. Um, so I think people can tell what's a real brand and what's a fake brand in this day and age. So I think authenticity mm -hmm. is key. In terms of luxury, luxury is really about the client and the experience. So you can never walk away from how you treat your clients. You have to treat your clients and your all of your clients and and remember that sometimes this is their first experience at Jimmy Choo and how do you get them to come back and bring their kids back and you know stay with you for 20 or 30 years right mm -hmm. so it's really about amazing experiences um, and and client relationships and service and I think mm -hmm. that's what sets luxury apart from non-luxury right it's 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 having that experience and making someone feel special um, and making them feel like they're the only person that's ever bought a Jimmy Choo shoe and continuing that conversation with them all the time, knowing their birthday, knowing their kids' names, taking them out for dinner, sending them flowers, things like that. So I think in luxury, that's really, um, it's really about experience versus um, anything else. You know, that's what keeps it that way. Does Thank that make you sense? So much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Before we move too far away from the Toronto topic, I'm also just wondering, I, you travel a ton for work, um, Milan, but also all over the country and right now for um, Jimmy Shoe stores. Is there a favorite place that you've gone and or any interesting city that? Um, I think in in my other roles uh, as well, I, listen, I love, I love Milan, Milan's fun. Um, but I do love uh, Tokyo, I love Japan, I love Hong Kong, um, I love Paris. I think there's just so many um, great places in the world and fashion is so diverse and it's so different by country. And I think um, learning that piece of it and if you ever have the experience to work in a global company and have a global role um, is so important because not everything is, you know, the best in America or the best in China or the best in, in Japan. Everyone has their own thing. And a lot of the time, I would say it's the 80-20 rule, where a lot of the time in luxury, you know, um, people are, you know, about 80% the same in terms of their taste and their fashion. And I would say that, you know, there's that 20% cultural difference. But in order to be successful, you have to understand that so that you do have different products and different things for different regions and even different marketing at this point. Anyone who, you know, still uses traditional marketing where you're using American models in Japan or in China, you know, you really, or Korea, for example, it's so important that people, because everyone has their own identity and it's super important now that people understand who you're talking to, that we're not all exactly the same. We don't look the same. We don't act the same. And if you're smart and if your company is smart and the brand is smart, then they will definitely uh, pay attention to that and make sure that, you know, uh, whether it's e -com, social media, um, or just product that they are talking to those different audiences and, and addressing those different clients so that they feel special as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, what about the most interesting person you've met along along your travels? <laughs> interesting person. Um, I would. I think. I think any of the creative people that I've worked for, like I had the opportunity when I worked at Ralph Lauren to meet Ralph Lauren, which is like mind blowing. Um, same thing with Mark Jacobs, being in the elevator with him, you know, going to the office, you know, Sandra Choi, who's our creative director. I think creative people, I think I have such a respect um, and even admiration because what they do and what they create is just, you know, mind blowing. And, and for me, I'm not creative, right? So I think it's just something that, that attracts me to them because it's a mind that is just so fascinating and so talented and 
and being able to build brands based on um, your own creativity, I think is huge. So I've been lucky enough working, you know, for those companies, these companies to to work with some really, really amazing creative people and, and met them too. And I mean, they're legends. Ralph Lauren's a legend. Mark Jacobs is a legend. You know, Sandra used to make shoes for, for Princess Diana. I mean, so you know, amazing. it's, yeah, exactly. So they're all legends. And yes. so I've been lucky enough, yes, I've been lucky enough in my life to be able to meet those people just throughout my career. That's great. Um, throughout, throughout your career, when you've made a move, have you ever had to rely on your network to move yourself forward? No. Well, let me, how do I, uh, I would say no, because any time that I've moved to another company, it's been because a recruiter has called to recruit me. So it's never been through friends that work in fashion. It's never been, um, you know, where I've called up and someone and said, hey, you know, I'm dying to work at whatever company and they happen to work there. So I find that in the fashion industry, because it is a small industry, that a lot of the time the recruiters are end up being your network too. Um, so you'll know recruiters that have gone from, you know, LVMH to Caring or to wherever, for, to different companies. And so you see familiar faces along the way, but I've never, um, I've never had a job through someone that I know, if that makes sense. It's always been through a recruiter and then I've gone, the, you know, the old fashioned way of going for 55 million interviews and, yeah. and hopefully getting the job or not getting the job sometimes. But um, it's never been through networking. However, networking is massively important because this industry is so small and you do end up meeting people and running into people, you know, year over year and different brands and there's a lot of, um, you know, there, there's not that many brands anymore. So you do end up meeting people along the way that you continue to see throughout your career. Yeah. Now how about the other direction, um, you know, with bringing people from your network? Oh, you God. or, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, a big, uh, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, yes, absolutely. So one thing I think that is, it's kind of a double-edged sword. And what I mean by that is that, yes, of course, it's great to work with people that you know and that you trust and that you've maybe taken from company to company. However, the other piece I've learned is that it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier that once you get to a company, you have to be there for a couple of months to understand the culture. Because just because you work with, you know, Cindy at Ralph Lauren, that doesn't mean that Cindy at Ralph Lauren is going to fit in at Marc Jacobs, right? Because the culture is very different. So I don't think it's smart to bring people from your past just because you know them and you think they're good at something unless they work culturally because culture is huge and it mm -hmm. plays a part in everything in all companies. And so you want to make sure, and not only that, it's not even that um, you're bringing someone that you've worked with in your past, but you also want that person to be successful and you want to be successful. So a lot of the time too, you can set yourself up for failure doing that if you don't pay attention to the nuances within the company and you can bring someone from one company to another company and they can absolutely fail. And then you feel awful because you brought them to a new company and they had a terrible experience. So, um, yeah, but I, I absolutely, in every single company that I've worked at, I have people that I've worked with in my past. And um, once I trust you and once I know that we work well together, I'll take you everywhere and anywhere with me if you want to go. <laughs> that's the key. Um, <laughs> but it's, that's fine too. But I think it's really important. I think the only way you can be successful um, in any company, fashion or otherwise, is to have a very, very, very strong team. And you have to be able to give them um, the leeway and the trust to be able to do their jobs and not be a micromanager. Because I think being a micromanager is a kiss of death um, because you just you never allow people to kind of grow their own wings or spread their own wings. And um, and that's not fun for anyone to be in a career where they never get to, you know, experience anything new or, you know, so. Um, yeah, I absolutely love bringing people to different places. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, there's definitely, I feel like that in, in my experience, there's there's a risk of all involved with it. Yeah. The risk, number one being, is the new company going to like them? And I don't just mean like your boss, I mean also, you know, your coworkers. And yeah. is that going to be a fit? 
Um, or is it going to make a target for them? And are they going to be happy? Because you have a certain amount of responsibility for them once you've Absolutely. Them <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's a tricky, it's a tricky line to walk. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think obviously uh, it goes to, it goes without saying that people who work hard are rewarded and um, you know, get brought along for these cool opportunities when yeah, yeah. it fits. Absolutely, yeah. Which is great. I also I was speaking with a student last week about recruiters and how important they are, even even at the early stages of a career, and how you shouldn't be afraid to talk with a recruiter and learn a little bit more about what you can expect out there. Mm -hmm. Because it can be a great resource to just mm -hmm. tell you the lay of the land, you know, what you can expect salary wise, what you can expect mm -hmm. from different ways, and um, people shouldn't be afraid to respond to a recruiter that may reach out. No, it's such a good thing to do, and it's so good to like just interview, 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 because it's hard to interview, and the more practice yeah. you get, the better you get at it, and then you're like, okay, this is so good now, because in the beginning, you don't know what to say because you always get the standard questions of what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, and you have yeah. to come up with something that's like, oh, is it too good? Is it too bad? Or um, <laughs> that interviewing all the time is such a good thing. And it doesn't even matter if you want the job or not, just interview because it gives you so much experience and then you understand what the questions are going to be. And then they eventually end up, there ends up being a pattern. And so you're not nervous when you're interviewing for a job that you actually really want. Yeah, that's a great yeah. tip for sure. Well, I think my last question before I turn it over to students is what, what piece of advice do you have for students to make them more hireable? Um, there's two things and one is kind of boring and that is just to work hard. <laughs> and what I mean by that, people are like, yeah, okay. Um, but I don't mean work hard. I mean outwork everyone you know. Because if you're that person who will go to the next level and will do anything and everything that your job requires and you don't go home until it's finished, your boss will always remember that. And they will always know that you're the person who's really there because you want to be there and you will be promoted because of that. And when everyone else goes out the door at 6 p.m. and you stay until 8 p.m. And I'm not saying to stay and do nothing and just look at your computer screen. I'm, I'm saying to add value. Like if you add value or you can make your boss or someone's life more easy and, and help them with something you know that, that they're doing, you will get, like you said, you will be rewarded for that 10 times over. Because there's just so many people right now and I'm seeing, unfortunately, I, you know, I obviously interview a lot of young people who are interns or people who are getting out of school, but it, there just seems to be right now this thing where it's like, okay, um, I have a life, so it's six o'clock and I'm leaving. But meanwhile, you know, you were supposed to, I'm making it up, finish, you know, logging all the shoes from Vogue for the day but you leave and you've only done 50% of it. And so what happens is that the next day you come, you're overwhelmed, your boss is yelling at you because I'm not yelling at you, but your boss is annoyed because you know, you're supposed to be on another job by that time. And, and you just decided to leave because you wanted to go and have drinks with your friends. Now, I'm also not saying don't have a social life. I do think that's obviously um, massively important too, but you just have to understand what's important. And, and if you are that person who goes over and above all the time and really shows interest, you will be promoted. You will move, you'll get to do anything you want to do in your career. And, you know, that's one thing when all of my friends were graduating from university and going on a year's tour of Europe and having fun. I didn't do that. I worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And now, 20 years later, I have so many people say, oh, my God, you know, how did you get to where you are and how come you're the president of the company? And I'm like, because I didn't go to Europe that first year. And, you know, <laughs> I go to Europe now. <laughs> you know, I work yes. hours a day. And, and I know that sounds wickedly boring, but it, it, it pays off in the end, you know. So that's, that's the advice that I would always give any young person. And then um, the other advice that I was always given, never ask someone to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. So I think it's really important to be humble and to remember where you came from. And just because you're the CEO of a company, that doesn't mean you can't get your own coffee. That doesn't mean that you can't help someone with something um, or, you know, we're all, we all start in the same place, you know, and, and never lose sight of that because I find that there's a lot of people in this world today 
um, and Bash and, and in other other uh, businesses who have kind of lost it, right? And they have a very high opinion of themselves, and egos can can drive people to very bad places, and 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 then it becomes your downfall too. So that's when you're not promoted anymore. Or that is your last job because your ego is, you know, you just don't remember who you are. And so I think that's yeah. a huge important thing that I learned as well. Those are great, great tips. Actually leads me to want to ask you one more question before I turn it over. I think clearly given your, your first response to students on, you know, working hard and stuff, how, how do you keep yourself so passionate about your job? Because it seems like you are very passionate about I'm talent. so passionate about <laughs> I mean, and I follow your Instagram feed. I see, you know, how how beautifully Jimmy Choo fits into your real yeah. world life, Thank too. You. Great. No, I absolutely, in any brand I've worked for, I absolutely love what I do. I love working in this industry. I've always wanted to work in this industry. So I guess one thing I will say, and I, I hate when people say I, I was lucky, but I do think, yes, of course, hard work plays the biggest role, but I do think I was lucky in that I knew that fashion was what I wanted to do, right? Even though I was going to be a lawyer, that was kind of my mother's passion um, for me to be a lawyer. <laughs> but I knew that as soon as you're passionate about something, and as soon as you love something, you just never want to not do it. So therefore, there's passion right away. You know, it's like when you have that, uh, you know, your favorite meal and you're like, oh, this is the best. You just have that <laughs> feeling every day, like, because... It's something that you genuinely enjoy, you look forward to, you know, you get the, the what everyone says is that it's not work, it's, you know, your your passion. It is work, everything's work at the end of the day. Yeah. But I yeah. mean, you just, you know, I just get so excited. I love what I do, I'm so lucky, you know, I get to wear Jimmy Choo's every single day of my life. I mean, who doesn't want to do that, right? So yeah, you know amazing. when you're um, in college and you're lucky enough to know that you really want to do something, that you really want to be a designer, or you really want to be in PR, then it's like every day, just be grateful for that and go out and do the best job you can. And like you said, and like I said, you'll be rewarded. And, and when you're rewarded, you're happy. I mean, you're just happy all the time because you're doing this thing that's just such an amazing experience. And I can't imagine, you know, doing anything else. So, uh, you know, the day that that goes away is the day that I will no longer be in fashion. But I just, it hasn't gone away. And, and I hope it yeah. never does. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of questions out there. Students, does anyone want to raise your hand? Uh, do you want to start? Do you? Sorry, I passed that wrong. <laughs> Hi. 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 Uh, what, uh, what, what do you think is the most important thing in the fashion industry? What do I think is the most important thing? Yes, in the fashion industry. M meaning, uh, what do I think is like the most important? Thing I've learned, or what's the most? Sorry, just so I understand, so I give you the right. Answer. What shoes? Shoes, oh. fashion. In shoes or in anything? Yeah, shoes. What do I think is the most important thing? I think that I think I don't know that it's specific to shoes or handbags or ready to wear. I think it goes back to the original conversation about brand, and um and being part of something that you believe in, right? So something that you personally love that, and you may not love shoes, you may love handbags and wanna work for a brand that only does handbags, or you may love ready to wear, or you may love everything, and then you work for a brand that does everything. Um, so I think it's really identifying what you believe in and what you like, um, what you identify with, you know, that maybe uh, I'm making it up that Dior is your everything and you could see yourself in a Dior ad all day long, you know, and, and that's what you're passionate about. And, and then if and when you go and you work in one of those brands while you're there, I think that's when you learn um, as part of the culture and the experience, whether it's shoes that you like, whether it's ready to wear that you like, whether it's bags or if it's just everything, which is even more amazing because I personally like everything. Um, but I think that it's really up to you and what you identify with most. And I think it's different by person, right? Because I think people like different things. So um, I think that's, I, did, did I answer your question the right way? Yeah. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 
Um, Claire, I have you next. Hi, uh, thanks for coming in here today. Um, okay, so I have a couple questions. Um, first one is, uh, what do you consider the most important advice for running a brand or company or management or that kind of thing? What do I think? Yeah. What, what I think is the most important advice for running a brand? Yeah. Okay, I think the most important advice, I think it goes back to what we were talking about, um, if it's luxury, for example, it's, it's actually, I, I lie, it's not, it doesn't even have to be luxury. I think understanding what the strategy is and setting that strategy and never deviating from that strategy. So whether it's about and understanding the brand and the disciplines around the brand, the DNA around the brand, never waver. That. Because if you do waver when you're the, the head or the representative for this brand and you waver, people will see that and, and they will not necessarily believe your story, right? So I think storytelling has to be super clear, super concise. Now, do I think that people have made this storytelling? 100%. And do I think you can change your course? Yes, but I don't think you can change your course too many times. So I think understanding what is and doing all of that back story homework of, of history and what something stands for is super important. And that goes back to earlier about that when you work for a brand, just to kind of not hang out, but really sit and study and learn everything that there is. And you may, you may one day say, is not what I'm into at all and this is not what I thought this would be and that's fine and you go to another brand that is that way so I think staying the course is super important okay um question is um what is the most rewarding part of um like being in the luxury goods industry versus what's the most challenging part Oof, there is a tough question um the most rewarding part is, as cheesy as this sounds, and again, I don't know that this is necessarily specific to luxury or if this cosmetics or anything. I think working in fashion where you get a lot of um, satisfaction is that you're able to change someone's mood like that. And what I mean by that is that, a perfect example, something I find so rewarding is that we have so many women who come to us and they're getting married and they want to wear Jimmy Choo. And just having to, to be with that person, that client, and see how excited they get and just to see how their mood changes and how people, you know, stand up straight or people are like, oh my gosh, like I look like a movie star. Just giving someone minutes of feeling good in this crazy world that we live in, I think is so rewarding. Um, helping people, giving people shoes. We give shoes to women who are, you know, single mothers who are homeless or interviewing for their first jobs, you know, things like that, where you're able to give back and give people, you know, someone who can afford a pair of Jimmy Choo's and, and giving them that opportunity and that, that first time um, that just like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get this job. I'm going to be the CEO of this company, you know, like just this confidence thing that comes over women and to see them get so excited is amazing. So that's rewarding. Um, the most challenging, um, I think the challenging piece is really trying to uh, weave the, the financial and the creative together that at the end of the day, yes, of course, we make pretty shoes and bags. That's that's amazing. But at the end of the day, I also need to make sure that I'm not paying, you know, that my rent in my store on Madison Avenue exceeds my sales. And I need to make sure that, you know, there's commerce behind it, right? It's a business. So yes, it's pretty. Yes, it's fun. Yes, people get excited because they're going to get married in a pair of Jimmy shoes. But at the same time, you're also um, managing people's livelihoods. So you have to successful because you have this team that works so hard for you and you have this amazing brand you also have to be smart in your choices financially um so and if you're not then that can turn into a, a very bad uh, situation <laughs> um so you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of pressure that comes with that especially with things like covid where people don't want to come into stores anymore and what we were talking about at the beginning like 
what do you do? How do you motivate teams? How do you get people excited? And what can we do differently? And, you know, even during COVID and so many people have had to go through this and having to furlough people and, and knowing that, you know, they have families and they have kids at home and this is their life. So those are, and so that's a pretty recent answer for you because I mean, that just happened. Luckily we're back back in business, which is great. And meaning that, you know, people are not furloughed anymore and stuff, but that's not, that's not a fun part of the job. And, and I take that very seriously because it affects people's personal lives, you know? So I would say that's probably the most difficult when you have to make decisions like that. Thank you. Uh, Janice, I have you next. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, so my name is Janice. Um, so one of the assignments that we had for this class was to attend a fashion event and like comment on it, but obviously like because of COVID, um, we were allowed to watch fashion documentaries instead. Um, one of the documentaries I chose to watch was <clears throat> from the series Seven Days Out. It's on Netflix where um, one of the episodes focused on the Chanel 2018 Spring Hot Couture Show. Mm -hmm. And uh, like for me, it served as the affirmation that I was on the right tr on the right track with like what I want to accomplish with my life um, as a designer and things like that. And I think doubt is really important because how can you ever be sure that something is right for you if you're not asking questions? 100%. Right. So my question to you is, um, what points in your fashion career did you receive confirmation that you were on the right track to becoming who you wanted to be? Um, hmm, oh God, the good questions. I think in my career, I think I, this probably sounds like such a cheesy answer, but I'm a captain obvious here. I'm going to give you an obvious question. I think as you go through your career and like, I mean, I started as an account executive, right? So throughout my career, there were two things. One was getting promoted in my job. So going from account executive to a director to a sales manager. Um, so that gives you confirmation, right? Because that means someone's telling you you're doing a good job because they're giving you more responsibility. But the second piece is really being contacted by recruiters and, and having those conversations with other brands like I mean hello I'm from Canada I'm working for this little designer by the name of Peter, Peter Nygaard and then all of a sudden I get a call from Ralph Lauren from the recruiter at Ralph Lauren I'm like oh my god like what is going on here you know so there are all those things in your life and then it's just like wait a second I just got a call from Marc Jacobs like these things are like mind-blowing right and then I went to Canada Goose and the Canada Goose I got a phone call from Jimmy Choo saying we're looking for a president so so for me, and it's just like, I still feel like I'm like, you know, 10 years old. It's like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what? Mark Jacobs yeah. wants me to come and work there. So those for me are little things as well as being promoted, right? Because you don't just go over being an account executive to a president. Right. But when you get these phone calls, because what happens throughout your career is that you have people who talk about you, good and bad, but the, the good ones are the ones that um, then tell the recruiters or you know your, your reputation in the industry is good. And that's how people find out about you. And then you get these amazing phone calls and then you're just like, whoa, you know, like <laughs> how's this happening? So that's what I feel like happened to me. And that was kind of like, okay, check, I'm in the right business. I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing it well because, you know, people want me to work for them. So I think that's really how you see it throughout your career. It starts with getting promoted and working hard and then getting phone calls and, you know, going to other companies. So, but by you watching the Chanel show, I mean, that's amazing. And, but it's so cool when you see something that you know you want so badly, right? And it's just like, yeah, I'm done. Like, this is it, we're done. <laughs> this is where I'm going, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. So, but that's the best feeling because, you know, there's a lot of people in the world who don't have that right. and they're lost. And and I'm, I, I thank God every day that I knew that because there's some people who, you know, they're like, maybe I'll be in fashion, maybe I'll be a chef, maybe I'll be something else. And I would just be like crazy if I was like that because I, I, I can't, I need a direct path. So just follow your dreams and never, ever, 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 ever stop and work harder than everyone. And then I'll be watching you on Zoom and I'll be asking you questions about being the CEO of Chanel. <laughs> I know what, whatever you're designing behind you looks amazing with those feathers. Yeah. Oh yeah, my Halloween costume. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. That's amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question in the chat from Sharon. She asks, what gets lost when a brand joins a conglomerate? What gets lost? Well, so far, I'm three years into it, and nothing has um, has been lost yet. I think, you know, that's, that's a, it's a really good question because a lot of people think just because um, a brand is part of a conglomerate that it is not necessarily a good thing. And I would hugely disagree with that because what actually ends up happening in LVMH is probably the best example of that because they own so many brands is, is being bought by a large company allows you to have opportunities that you've never had before. And what I mean by that, it means usually cash flow, which is a huge thing because in fashion, a lot of smaller brands, you know, cash is not easy to come by, especially now in this day and age. So you're able to market differently. You're able to, you know, where you were using, I'm making this up, of course, where you're able to use, you know, mainstream models who, you know, or just local models, you're getting to use Bella Hadid or, you know, it, it just takes everything to another level. So as long as the conglomerate is um, and the management, which is at Capri um, and I, I've experienced for the last three years, is focused on allowing the brands to run as Jimmy Choo or Versace or Michael Kors and they stay true to that, then there's no negative. It's all positive because it just allows to take the brand from, you know, a, a 500 million to a billion or a billion to 10 billion. That's how, you know, huge brands are built. So um, I'm all for it and I think it's great. Now, are there growing pains when you're trying to figure out the logistics and shipping from certain warehouses and combining things? Absolutely. With IT, whether you have SAP or whether you do everything on an Excel spreadsheet, sheet, absolutely. But those are just little growing pains. And at the end of the day, there's a bigger picture where you will benefit from, you know, a greater good of it all. So for us, it's been great. And at LVMH, it was a huge conglomerate as well. Um, it was amazing, too, because the brands really operated as the brands. I, I'll, I'll chime in as well, because my time at G3 Apparel, there was yeah. definitely a lot of, you know, brands joining or leaving. And one of the things at that level, which is not luxury, it's more, you know, every day Macy's fair. Mm -hmm. um, you can save so much money on a production standpoint by using the same factory because one thing maybe you guys don't realize yet is that the more units you buy of something, the less the item will cost you because you can buy more of the fabric and you can buy more right. units for that, for that um, specific factory overseas. So that's a huge factor, I think, at that level. Mm -hmm. um, Totally. But I will say that there, they oftentimes would say, hey, this thing is working so great for Calvin Klein. Why don't you just slap the Kenzie label on it and sell it over on your floor? And maybe you guys will sell it really well. And then I think to your point, you start to lose your brand identity and there's none of that, you know, yeah. special, special sauce that makes that brand so amazing that totally. the customer reacts to. So it's, yeah. it's definitely a it's fine a line. Yeah. 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 Totally. <laughs> Uh, Wieletta, I have you next. One second, let me just, can you see me? Okay. Hi, Hi. thank you for being here today. It's been really fascinating, like listening to everything you've had to say, because like we've mostly had like designers and like CEOs, so it's interesting to see how, from like a marketing standpoint, how everything works behind the scenes. So I guess what I'm very curious about is that like, let's say Jimmy Choo wants to do a collection. How do you go about like making that budget plan, making sure it's going to benefit everyone initially in the sense of like cost production and making sure it's like efficiently put together. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. So thankfully that's not my job. That is the job oh. of, of people way smarter than me who work in. so. Always with a creative piece and design, there's design, right? And all they do is design because that's what they're amazing at. But there's also a whole costing exercise, a margin, which obviously that is me. But um, so from a cost of goods standpoint and kind of like, like what we were just saying about factories. So you have the whole that piece of it, which is another team who negotiates the prices, 
people who buy the leathers, you have to understand how many units you're buying to get the best price on the on the leather. Um, and then everything rolls up to a gross margin and gross margin and EBIT are things that are you'll learn about or you've already learned about that are hugely important from a budget standpoint. And and so you have to understand all of those things in order to make sure that um, you're protecting that piece of the business. However, 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 it doesn't matter which business you work in in luxury or non-luxury. If a collection is bad, it's just bad. You know, there are things that are bad. And someone may just think, oh, let's design purple um, uh, mesh shoes this season. And you're like, oh, boy. So you have to figure out, OK, understood that purple mesh shoes are the, the thing of the season. They may not sell. So you need to figure out what else you can buy to offset the purple mesh shoes, right? So you always need to have that balance. It's like putting together a puzzle to make sure that you're protecting your margin and everything else. Because what happens is then if things don't sell, as you know, then they go on sale and they get slashed to 40 off and then 50 off and then 60 off. And when you start getting into 60 and 70, off, no one's making money anymore, right? So that usually means something wasn't very successful or it wasn't very commercial. So once you understand the formula, and I hate to use that word, but you, the formula of what you need to protect. So if I go to Milan and I see that purple mesh shoes are the, 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 the thing, but I know I'm not going to sell a ton of purple mesh shoes. I also need to know how many black pointy toe pumps I sold, how many boots I sold, all of those things so that you have that backup, right? that you walk into a store and you don't just see purple shoes at Jimmy Choo, that you make sure you have a balance. So it's just really swinging the pendulum um, and making sure that you are hyper analytical in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And that is where you can get into tricky conversations. And what I said about sales, where you have to kind of be like the UN, because think about it, if you're a designer, right, which I'm assuming you are based on what's behind you, and someone <laughs> says to you, I, I hate your yellow tank top that you're wearing today. And meanwhile, you've designed 50 million yellow tank tops because you think that's the best thing in the world, but you have salespeople who come in and say, they're not gonna sell. It's like saying that you're, you're, you have an ugly baby, right? Because you created this yellow tank top. So you have to be so good with communication and say, okay, I love your yellow tank top, but I need you to know, I'm making this up, that in Denmark, people don't like yellow. So can you also make it in red and purple and green? And you as a designer will probably say yes, but I want you to make sure that the yellow one is the one that's in the store window because that's what is your inspiration and that's what represents your point of view, right? So as long as you have good communication and understanding how to deal with creative people, because you guys are creative, everything's in your head, you're designing things based on emotion, that you know, all of that. Then there's people like me who are like, okay, that doesn't sell, this sells but you have to figure out, okay, if this is the inspiration, let's show this, this is the story that we tell, this is the marketing that we do, but you'll sell 80 million black tank tops. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's a balance between both. It's like commerce and creative. And when they're married and they're good, it's the best marriage in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like the concept of like, if you like one thing so much, might as well kind of get in every color. Or at yeah. least have a variety in choice. Yeah. Is what I'm kind of understanding from that. Yeah, but as a creative person, though, and I'm not a creative person, it's just I can see it's so hard to have to say to someone, Ugh, we don't like those shoes or those shoes aren't going to sell. Like, I mean, it's like your blood, sweat and tears designing this stuff. Right. And then you've got someone saying to you. So you have to figure out how you can as a designer. Also, I would give the advice to, to have an open mind, even though someone mm -hmm. says, you know, I. I I like your yellow tank top. I don't think we're going to sell a million units of it. Can you help me with other colors or with something else that, that will sell? And if you're a designer that can listen and get past the, oh my God, this was my favorite thing in the whole wide world, then you'll be super successful because you have that open mind and it's, a, it's kind of like a business mind too, right? Because at the end of the day, it's a business. So there's definitely the the aspirational things and the wow things that have to be in the windows and the magazines that make them, everyone come in and buy the black tank top, you know? Okay. Yeah. And then I have one other question, because yeah. since your situation is a bit more unique in the sense of like you didn't find jobs like through connections and people, you're mostly recruited for those jobs. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the best way to stand out or what you think that you stood out in 
that made you be recruited and is a good way for us to know in the future so we can become recruited as well. Straight up, hands on heart. My every single job, I think, every single job I've got has been through LinkedIn. So I think LinkedIn is the best thing in the entire world. Um, I think there's so many eyes and so many people on LinkedIn. I think making sure that you have a profile photo, don't just have that little weird cartoon head thing. Make sure that you have a photo so that, you know, it looks like you're actually engaged in LinkedIn, um, that you have a good bio, that you have any kind of experience, whether you did, you know, um, experience at school or different um, groups that you belong to. I think LinkedIn is amazing. And it's, there's tons of recruiters and most of the people, the only job I didn't get through LinkedIn was Ralph Lauren because that was through um, someone who told a recruiter about me. Um, but everything else has been on LinkedIn and that's in my personal experience. Jimmy Chu was on LinkedIn, Ken Goose was on LinkedIn. There's a ton of people on LinkedIn and just make sure that you keep on getting connections, connect with people, connect with anyone, like connect with like the CEO of like Jeff Bezos. He may not say yes, but just send invitations and connect with people because they'll be surprised because it's good to have connections, you know, and, and then when people are searching for certain jobs or internships and stuff. I think LinkedIn's a really good place. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I really of appreciate course. it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So I think the last question of the day is that I also had a chat. It's from Nimrita. She says, what would you say is the most important point to keep in mind during an interview? the most important point to keep mm -hmm. um i think i think listening is super important and making sure you understand what they're asking you because it's weird and i think i did it too when i was younger um i think you're in such a rush because you're so excited over the interview that sometimes you don't listen to what the question is and then you just start talking about how much you love the brand or something um I think really listen and like and take pauses and I'm, I'm saying this as I speak at hundred miles an hour, but take pauses and be well um, thought through in terms of what your responses are going to be. And whenever anyone asks you what your strengths or weaknesses are, always have an answer for that. And yes, of course you can spin it into, you know, I, I like to work 24 hours a day and I guess I would call that a weakness. Just have a good answer because I find those questions, first of all, I find them obnoxious because who's going to tell you they're bad at anything? You know what I mean? So I think they're ridiculous questions, but you will be asked a million times. And I do like when people ask you, um, you know, how would you react in this situation? And just be yourself, let your personality come out. And I, and because if you don't let your personality come out, then you don't know what the company's like in terms of culture and they don't know what you're like. So sometimes when your personality comes out and they're like, oh gosh, she just talks too much. She's not for us. That's a good thing. That's a blessing in disguise, right? Because it's a type of company that you wouldn't have fit into well anyway. So just be yourself, smile, relax yeah. as much as you can always dress up or dress the part like if you're going to work in a fashion company don't show up in track pants don't show up in like and I don't mean that to sound like I'm 90 years old but it's like I would if I could and I did in most of my jobs even in my 20s if you can wear something from the brand that you're interviewing in everyone notices so if you can wear a Jimmy Choo you go on the real real or you go to rent the runway or whatever and buy the dress of you know whatever brand you're interviewing for I would highly 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 suggest that because when people come and they interview a Jimmy Choo and they're wearing a pair of Christian Louboutin shoes I'm done I'm done usually within the first five minutes because for me, it's a respect thing, right? Like, you know where you're walking into. So why are you wearing, it's like walking into Ralph Lauren and wearing a Tommy Hilfiger, yeah, huge emblem <laughs> on your shirt. It's just like, no, 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 no. Like, do you know where you just walked into? So I have a really, really, really strong point of view on that. Some people might tell you very differently, but it's just like, it's a respect thing. You know what I mean? It's like when you walk into someone's house, you don't tell them you don't like the food that they just cooked. So show up and show up for the brand that you want to work for and, and look like you want to work there. It would be my advice as well. That's great advice. Yeah. I mean, I, I 
think it's important that you remember that the person who's interviewing you, particularly when you're early in your career, you're probably going to be working with this person on a day in and day out basis. And you want to like them and you want them to like you. So the more that you show who you are and try to make yourself a likable, you know, a likable representation of yourself, I think the better you're going to end up doing in that interview. Totally. I and to agree. your point, if it, if it if they don't like you, then better you know now than in yeah exactly. You know, it's like when you go on a date. It's like when yeah. you go on a date. If you don't get a call that great. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, this was amazing. Thank you so so much for coming on. Thank you. And this was awesome. Someday we'll be back again in person, which will be great. Yes, I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait. And thank you for all the awesome questions. And if anyone has any questions or anything, you know, shoot me an email on LinkedIn or whatever. I'm always happy. Carolyn, you've got my information. I'm always happy to help. So I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right. Great. We'll stay safe. You. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Um, students, I'm just going to flash up the attendance question if you go your screen. And I look forward to hearing your responses. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions for me? All right. Well, till next week, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I only just realized my Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.